Subia Mo. Namaste and greetings. I, Subia Moin, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evamiti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all at IMPRI, hashtag Web Policy Talk. Today, we are gathered for a special talk on the topic gender and disability shifting the discourse to focus on social inclusion by Professor Linda Lin. This deliberation is a part of the State of Gender Equality hashtag Gender Gaps series, which is organized by the INPRI Gender Impact Studies Center. As the chair for the session, we have Professor Vibhuti Patel, visiting distinguished professor at INPRI and GISC, former professor, Tata Institute of Social Science. We welcome you, ma'am. With permission of chair, I would like to introduce the gathering. Vibhuti ma'am. Uh, Vibhuti ma'am, shall I introduce yeah. the gathering? Yes, Subhya. Thank you very much for introducing me and please introduce the panelists. Yeah. We are elated to welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Linda Lane. Professor Linda Lane is a senior lecturer at the School of Social Work, University of Gothenburg, Sweden. Her other academic assignments include a Linear Spam Fellowship at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai and guest researcher at Indira Gandhi National Open University in New Delhi. Prior to her academic career, Professor Linda worked as a civil servant for the city of Gothenburg. Her research and teaching interests include labor studies, gender, livelihoods and development, feminist and post-colonial international relations. We are also joined by esteemed discussants. First of all, we'd like to welcome Professor Bhavna Mehta, Professor in Social Work, Dean and Head, Faculty of Social Work, Maharaja Sayaji Rao, University of Baroda. We'd also like to welcome Nidhi Goyal, Founder and Executive Director, Rising Flame, Mumbai. We'd also like to welcome Purnima Nayar, Director, Health and Disability, Apnalaya, Mumbai. Dr. Prerna Sharma, Social Work Practitioner and Educator, formerly with NGOs, Share and Adapt, and TIFF and SNDT's Women's University, Mumbai. We welcome you, ma'am. Professor Renu Adalakha, Professor, Center for Women's Development Studies, New Delhi. Professor Sandhya Limai, Professor, Center for Disability Studies and Action, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. We'd also like to welcome Professor Sujata Bhan, Professor and Head, Department of Special Education, SNDT, Women's University, Mumbai. We'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. Now, I invite our chair, Professor Vibhuti Patel, to initiate the deliberation with her opening remarks, invite our esteemed speaker, and to proceed further. We look forward to learning from the esteemed gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Subhya. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Arjun Kumar for a very uh, thoughtful decision of this today's panel discussion. Professor Linda Lane, Professor Bhavna Mehta, Dr. Niti Goel, Ms. Purnima Nair, Dr. Prerna Sharma, Professor Ren Watlaka, Professor Sandhya Lime, and Professor Sujata uh, Ban, I greet you. And today I would like to tell the participants that we have a galaxy of star advocates and practitioners of disability movement who have dedicated best years of their lives uh, for the cause of right of persons facing special challenges. It is very humbling experience for me to moderate a session in which great stalwarts will be providing robust situational analysis, evidence-based policy recommendations, pathway and pathways for future. IMPRI has received an overwhelming response for this webinar uh, on both, like the, and there are participants on YouTube, Facebook, and uh, 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 Zoom participants. Uh, I greet you all. So what I would like to start with that uh, statement that collective wisdom of researchers and activists from disability movement, academic and research institutions, think tanks and voluntary groups, and community-based organization needs to be disseminated widely. 
the research outcomes and advocacy material of triangulation of gender equality, disability, and social exclusion must lead the policymakers to evolve an institutional support system based on social inclusion. Their experiences, perspectives, approaches, and methodology need wide publicity. Diversity of life worlds of persons with varied forms of challenges, intersectional vulnerabilities, mental, physical, sexual violence, uh, domestic violence, reproductive health issues such as menstruation, pregnancy, childbirth, their sexual rights and family planning, uh, impact of disasters, whether it's a natural disaster or a public health emergency like pandemic, coronavirus pandemic, uh, the, or women's leadership access to economic resources and issues that are often hidden and marginalized, such as issues specific to women heads of the household, elderly people, migrant uh, workers with disability, they need to be understood for better intervention. Discourse on gender, disability, and social inclu inclusion is marked by advocacy for gender responsive, disability friendly infrastructure, access to gender justice, gender sensitive health policies and health services gender aware and non-stigmatizing social protection services and mental health services. Learning about intersectionality reminds us that when advocating for gender equality and human rights, our activism should be intersectional and account for people of all caste, ethnic groups, gender, sexuality, abilities, and uh, class. Uh, which is very essential. With this preliminary remark, first of all, I would like to request today's uh, uh, special lecture uh, 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 expert, uh, Dr. Linda Lane, to make her presentation. Over to Dr. Linda Lane. Thank you very, very much. I feel extremely humbled and at the same time very elated to be here today because seeing the faces and knowing the institutions that some of you represent. It feels like a kind of homecoming uh, to Professor Lamayi from TIS. Uh, it's like, you know, seeing a, a face from before when I was as a, a Linnaeus Palm uh, fellow at TIS. I really appreciated the support I got from you and your colleagues there. And also to, uh, Athnalaya, uh, where I was also privileged to visit during my term in, in, in TIS, at TIS, but also an organization that's called Nashio, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, who was also working specifically with building different kinds of support uh, uh, tools and uh, possibilities for people who had uh, then been become disabled or were disabled from birth. So I feel that this is this is the right place to be just today. Now, when I was at TIS, one of the things that I was researching more specifically at that time was the possibility for young people to engage in higher education. So together with colleagues from six other European countries, my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Madhura now. Nachudri, I think I'm pronouncing it perhaps incompletely, but we, we wrote a paper about teachers' attitudes to students with disability in, in higher education. And unfortunately, the statistics that we knew then, that is the lack of students and the specific lack of, of children or young people with a vis not only visible but invisible disabilities is still the same. And this is not particular to India that is very important that you know that. Even in the West, we see that young people with disability, their possibilities of, first of all, accessing higher education is very limited. Uh, it's very much dependent on clause. That is, if your parents can afford to send you, it's, in, in, you know, it's dependent on ethnicity, all of these things, genders, of course. So if we can observe that there are so few people with disabilities in higher education, what must the situation look like for those who have not yet been able to get there? And that's where I want to take my point of departure today, because I know all of you are experts, and I'm hoping we can have some interesting discussions about this. So anything I say here is just for to open up discussion. It is not in any, case, any way to kind of make any 
definite statements about anything. I'm just hoping that this is a way that we can get the discussion started. So if I could have the first slide, please. Uh, number two. Uh, yeah. So what are we talking about here? And today we are specifically going to be talking about women and girls with disabilities. And this refers, of course, to women, including adolescent girls and young women. And it's about different kinds of disabilities. They're both physical, psychosocial, intellectual, or mental, sensory conditions with and without functional limitations. So the point I'm trying to make here is, you know, Disability is a very wide, a very broad spectrum of different kinds of impairments. And we may be open to seeing some of them and including some people who have these impairments in our societies at all levels, while others we might, for any number of reasons, decide that we are not so interested in. And, you know, this of course goes back to how governments uh, foreign policy, how they finance, uh, interventions, support, uh, what can social work do, what can other stakeholders, NGOs, other people outside of academia, how can we all contribute to improving the situation? So I'm just going to start by saying, first of all, if you see inequality as them, that is those, those other people, those that are not me, are not people like myself, or you see them as unfortunate others, oi, 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 somebody to feel sorry for, then that is a problem. That is a problem not only for them, but also for yourself and for us. Thank you. Could you, next picture, please. Now, just to give you an idea about what the situation is for women and girls with disabilities. I mean, as I said in the beginning, we don't see them in higher education, or we see very few. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, around the world, when we look at prevalence of disability, if 19.2% are women and around, you know, 12% are men, about, we have no clear statistics for every country about what the situation is. Now, this could be about, you know, stigma. It could be about governments not wanting to count people, or maybe they're just not looking in the right place. But the point I'm trying to make is that the statistics are not complete. In all, you know, probability, there are more, both the percentage is higher for women and probably the percentage is higher for men. Even if we accept that this might be a ballpark figure, then we know that of all the children, all of the women who are illiterate, the predominant number of them are women with disabilities. That is, these young people have not had access to any school at all. One third of the children out of school have a disability. And that is across the board. I'm not talking about specifically India or, you know, I'm talking about children in general. So even in America or in Sweden, where we have laws that are supposed to support all children, maybe they are there, but maybe they are in special arrangements. They are not part of the, what we would call the integrated school system. Without education and with a disability, girls and women are more likely to be more discriminated in, you know, regarding access to education, uh, regarding access to other kinds of resources. Uh, they are at the low place on the totem pole. And if we add in ethnicity, caste, class, we know that this, this hierarchy, you know, puts them even lower down. Now, women and children, uh, women and girls with disability also have less power. That means that because they are less well-educated, because they are more likely to be illiterate, they are more likely to have less power in the households, in their communities. They will face discrimination from men and boys more than women and girls who are not disabled. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, levels of discrimination that affect women and girls with disabilities. For, aside from that, they are three times more likely to be married off early. If somebody wants to marry them and take the responsibility for them, then good riddance, 
you know. So it is not just that they, you know, aren't don't have access to education. They are also low valued, and they are also more likely to experience early pregnancy and to be subject to harmful practices to protect them. That is, you you know, we have these predators who want to, uh, in the in the argument for uh, we're doing them good. Maybe they want to. Um, they would push for family planning. Uh, they would push for kinds of uh, 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 invasive uh, medical examinations just to protect young girls and women. So these things we have to pay attention to. And of course, again, all of these things add up. If you don't have education, then barriers, of course, to employment are real. You are more than likely, twice as likely to be unemployed if you have you are a woman with unemployment uh, with disabilities. And of course, the, perhaps, you know, if we link all of these things together, we see that women and girls with disabilities experience higher rates of gender-based violence, sexual abuse, neglect, maltreatment, exploitation. And this is in relationship to girls and women without disabilities. So it's not strange and it's not, it's not something that we would expect to be different in the sense that if this is what they are experiencing, then of course we will not see these young girls growing up to be college graduates because they are, their, their life chances have already been reduced as children. Next slide, please. Now, when we talk about disability, and you know there are different models, and I'm sure that there are lots of ways of thinking about what they can be. Uh, these are the ones that we've been using predominantly uh, in social work. Um, of course, there are others, and you will see, of course, depending on locality, maybe one or the other takes precedence. Now, in the West just now, the medical model has been put aside because we are trying to understand disability not as a personal tragedy, but as a, as a situation that is constructed by disabling barriers. That is, if we had a society that embraced people of all categories, including those who have disability, then we wouldn't, it wouldn't be a personal individual tragedy. It would be something that we, as a, as a society, would be interested in, 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 in becoming involved in. Now, we also have this kind of affirmative positive identity thing where, you know, a lot of people are seeing their disabilities as something that is socially constructed, but we're seeing these impairments as not as a, specifically as a limitation. To give you an example of that, we could think about uh, impairments such as uh, several different forms of autism, uh, ADHD, and other kinds of, you know, um, uh, mental, uh, psycho, psycho mental uh, impairments, where suddenly, you know, to have the right kind of autism, you're seen as, oh, you are very much focused, you're the ideal worker in the IT section or whatever, because uh, it is assumed that people who have these special kinds of gifts, if you will, have um, uh, a, a new, uh, 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 another view on life, another view, and they, and they can use that in their in the way that they work in the labor market. So these are kind of valued um, uh, identity markers, if you will. The one thing you might notice there when we are looking at these kinds of affirmative positive identities, they are very seldom inclusive of women. I mean, if we look at the, you know, the films and, you know, the Rain Man's and the whatever it is, it's all about savant men. It's very seldom that we hear about women who are poor and race in the same way. Now, the human rights perspective has been the focus of social work. And it has also been interesting for us as social workers to, um, to consider the medical model, to try to talk about the social model. But basically what we're saying that it is, we are for human dignity. Every human person, every person alive has the right to live a life in dignity. So this would include taking, uh, you know, into consideration cultural uh, cultural values, ways of looking at it, who's who, uh, how we do things in Sweden, contra how you do things in India, or specifically maybe in Mumbai or Delhi. So 
we are open to that, but the idea is that everybody has the right to live a life in dignity. So whether or not this is, these are models that you embrace, I think they do open up the possibility for us to look at what disability is and how we can discuss it in, you know, in, a, in a number of different ways. So next slide, please. And I think this is very important, whether or not it doesn't matter which model you embrace. All people, persons with disabilities are vulnerable to, bull, to violence and abuse. Now, it is known that women with disabilities, as I've pointed out previously, are more, uh, they're, they're more likely to experience violent abuse, violence and abuse in their life course. But these are, you know, kind of intersecting forms of discrimination and violence. Every woman is not going to experience violence and discrimination in the same way. And every person who has an impairment will not be discriminated as another person who has another form of impairment. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because there is a discussion now around this kind of hierarchy of preferences that exist that, you know, around the relative positions of people with certain kinds of disabilities. Now, this is of course, kind of gender coded in some respects. And as I pointed out before, uh, this kind of uh, valuation or uplifting of this special forms of altruism, uh, uh, autism that allows people to focus, even though they may have other forms of socially unacceptable behaviors, is, is just one of these. Men in wheelchairs that have acquired their uh, injury, that is that they were not born with it, but they were doing something very manly, maybe uh, riding a multi motorcycle or whatever and had an accident and, you know, got their legs broken and, or whatever, but these kinds of acquired manly uh, impairments are at the top. They are the ones we see. So these are often followed by other forms of physical disabilities like deafness, low sight, blindness, uh, and then you have those at the bottom of the totem pole, uh, things like diabetes, HIV, AIDS, um, you know, we don't really want to talk about that. And of course, we have other cognitive disabilities like learning disabilities, uh, dyslexia, uh, dyspeplia, and these are more acceptable uh, in some ways because they are not, you know, we look normal <laughs> and uh, and we can assume that the person is functional, that you don't have to tell anybody that you have dyslexia or dyscalculia. On the other hand, people with invisible disabilities face more stigma than people with dis visible disabilities. So we are more likely to be accepting of this man in his wheelchair than we are with people with mental illness, for example. This is a way of life. Lay, you know, again, you can add this on your matrix of other kinds of intersecting uh, uh, categories like gender, not only gender, but ethnicity, race, caste, et cetera. And of course you see how people with these disabilities not only merge together, but they are constantly being moved to the bottom of the list. This of course means that there are probably less, less or you know, fewer um, resources available to these people. Uh, they are less likely to uh, talk about their disabilities unless they are forced to. And we have this tendency, unfortunately, of becoming saviors of the disabled. We don't see them as being capable of doing things for themselves. So next slide, please. And this is why, you know, and I think uh, Professor Patel, uh, Patel will, you know, kind of uh, speak to it. It's intersectionality is, is something that I, I feel very uh, close to, quite simply because it allows us to see not only people with disability, but people of all categories in their multifaceted self. We are not just one thing. We are many things. We are not only a disabled person. We are a woman or a girl, and we have, 
Maybe we have lots of social advantages. Maybe we are very wealthy, maybe we are very poor. Maybe we have a home, maybe we do not. But all of these things play a very important role in kind of positioning us in terms of that slide that I showed around life chances, who I am, how my multiple categories of differences intersect with each other will, you know, will determine whether or not I, I feel or de facto are uh, discriminated. Now I've included some things here that we can talk about, like this double disadvantage. That is, you know, when you have one or more or three or four uh, disadvantages that are, you know, grouped together to form this kind of marginalized identity. But I also want to mention this with prominence in the sense that, you know, maybe one of your multiple, your marginal identities is the one that determines how other people look at you. Now, in there, in, you know, in, maybe in the Indian can context, context, we could talk about caste. You know, if you're at the lowest end of the caste totem pole, then, you know, that will determine a lot of other things in the way we look at who you are as a disabled person. In the American context, we can talk about race and class and things like obesity, for example. You know, now it's, in, unfortunately, it's, you know, we have this thing about fat shaming in the American context where people with a disability who may be, you know, obese at the same time, we don't see their disability, we see just their obesity, which, you know, contributes to a lot of stigma, for example. Now, of course, intersectionality will not take this away, but it, what it does, it helps us to understand that you know, disability is not, does not exist in a vacuum, uh, that forms of oppression and disadvantage such as poverty, trauma, police violence, and other factors also interact with disability. And this is, you know, not just, you know, where we are today, but, you know, everywhere. And of course, this will depend a little bit in levels about where you are, whether you're in Sweden, America, or in India. The important takeaway here for me is the fact that one size does not fit all. We have to think outside of the box when we were talking about uh, disability, but also about gender, because disability theories overlap with each other, they inform each other. And we have to, if we want to make some changes, then we have to kind of consider how systems of oppression and other identities interact with each other to create uh, discriminatory practices for people with, and in this case, women and girls with disability. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, the whole idea was to talk about inclusion, but that is some, you know, it's a very broad <laughs> subject. And I'm not going to try to kind of, you know, give any in a, in a clear answer to that, but I'm just going to say that as social workers, as social workers, this is what we try to do. And sometimes we, we manage to do that and sometimes we don't, but that is our goal, you know, that inclusion is right space, that it's, you know, but we understand that right, having the right to something doesn't mean that you get that right, but you have the right because and right-based approach is complex, but it is about transforming rules about changing attitudes and behaviors towards people with disability. Inclusion demands and requires that we respect and give dignity and valorize human diversity. As uh, Professor Patel said in the beginning, this is about everyone, every one of us. Yeah? We have the right to live decent lives. It demands access to participation and appropriate policies formulated with women and girls, not for women and girls, but with them. And of course, if we're talking about people with disabilities who may be you know, at the low end of the totem pole, maybe we get a bit impatient. We want to do something so much that we become a for them instead of a with them. But I'm going to argue that with them is the best strategy. Because inclusion also requires appropriate interventions to remove barriers and prejudices which support women and girls' right to decent lives. So if we don't consider how we're going to work with them, anything we do for them is more or less guaranteed 
to not work. And then we'll be there. And as we've often done, we blame them because, you know, it's easier to blame someone who can't answer for themselves instead of maybe taking another look at ourselves and the interventions and the kind of supports we want to get and kind of think, well, how could we then have been more inclusive of what they really need and what they, what they desire and what they want? So I'm, um, you know, just going to say here that the adage about nothing about us without us still stands. And that's something we should be looking forward to and engaging with. Next slide, please. So uh, my final uh, picture here is just to say something about us as a profession. And, you know, even people who are not uh, social workers who are working on these issues, I think you recognize yourselves here. Uh, I'm just, you know, taking my point of departure in, this, in the field of social work. And to, you know, nothing that I can say here is, is probably any different from, from what you're doing in your everyday work. But we should, you know, kind of take into consideration the most marginalized, the most unrepresented population groups, and then consider how we can, you know, improve disability awareness, capacity building. How can we train stakeholders, parents, teachers, volunteers? How can we, as, as, as researchers, work with participatory research? And how can we be inclusive of the community that these groups come from? And most of all, I want to lift something that I find really interesting here is the fact that women and girls in disability are poorly represented in national accounts. We need to look at how we can get well, I don't know, um, good statistics about the situation for women and girls in all national accounts. And so that it's not these general estimates that you, you know, kind of making based on somebody's uh, approximate ideas about what, this is, what the issue is. So make sure that women and girls are counted in national accounts. So I will finish by saying to ensure that inclusion is met for everyone, social workers and their allies in all sectors must observe, analyze, plan and act and evaluate by incorporating gender and disability in their multi intersections. So everybody has to be there in every phase of response with the human rights-based approach. So we've got a lot of work to do, but I think this panel today will kind of take this, this subject and the discussion forward. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Linda Lane, for bringing out a very important insights about uh, the so-called uh, protecting them and in the name of that so many horrible practices which are going on. You have also unpacked the uh, issue of uh, various uh, terminologies which are being used. You have also re reflected on the models of disability and also the question of hierarchies of unspoken disability. I think that's, that's a very important and new uh, insight that you have brought in and also the how to foster social inclusion. So I think it's going, going to give us a lot of food, of food for thought. My first question is to Professor Bhavna Mehta, because uh, you have been in the, an academician in the social work faculty. And how do you respond to Dr. Linda Lane's presentation? And do you see any parallels in your work in a city of Baroda, MS University? Yeah, thank you, Vibhidhubin, uh, for having me here. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Linda, for raising the very, very important um, topical issue, uh, which, um, I would like to admit that we don't discuss too much about. Uh, while uh, people with disability are invisible, as you said, but women with disability are more invisible uh, in all the discourses, as well as uh, in, in and around us also in society. So um, let me start with uh, saying that, that uh, the last statement that you made, uh, nothing without, uh, nothing for, you know, without us, that's so very important. So this entire inclusion in terms of uh, inclusivity of having um, people with disability in general and women more so specifically is um, so very important uh, agenda that we as a social worker need to really take it on. 
um of course at the faculty of social work the maharaja sahaji rao university of baroda which i represent uh, we do have um, a course where uh, we talk about working with people with disability we do have our field work uh, agencies uh, which are working with people with disability and our students going there uh, and learning uh, you know and getting in that process sensitizing themselves with the entire issue and how it can be addressed by the social worker however as an institution uh, you know playing a role of an advocate um, uh, has is not that very aggressive the way it should be um, we started some doing something on this uh, you know agenda maybe um, around 20 years ago with the handicapped international uh, you know taking up city of vadodara making it disabled friendly Uh, and therein uh, faculty of social work was uh, part of that entire initiative uh, what we started 20 years ago is um, the agenda was to make the entire city more accessible uh, which is one of the uh, things to uh, start with uh, you know are the parameters of uh, having people to see people more visible around us so unless uh, there are ramps unless there are sign boards unless there are you know um footpaths which are more disabled friendly the public vehicles which are friendly you will not see people around um vadodara is also a city which is on its way to become smart city uh but at the same time let me admit if i review back the situation after 20 years i don't think we have made much much progress so um in terms of the four uh, parameters uh, that you also indirectly touched upon in terms of uh, working with people with disability which as we start with accessibility affordability availability and quality i think these are the four uh, areas where a lot needs to be done uh, and uh, if we look at each and every aspect uh, of um, people's life right from infrastructure to having people inclusiveness You know, with you as part of your team member with you in the or uh, in your institution as a students as a faculty member as um, admin admin staff the entire four a's is not that very you know uh, conducive uh, environment which will facilitate uh, uh, inclusiveness so having said that admitted that we have a long way to go as i completely agree with that last statement also um, what you said um, at the same time um, there are success stories uh, there are initiatives about which i'm also very happy and uh, um, you know would like to cite some examples also to say that however we need to still scale it up um and uh, and with my own little work uh, in this field and more so in the field related to diversity and inclusion which talks not only about people with disability but also gender in, uh, per se um you know there is a model which uh, i'm proposing and that, that is that begins with a vision um uh, that is a vision to have a inclusive society vision to have a society which is more diversified which talks which of course has people with disability um and more so women with disability queer populations you know lgbt community um all kind of groups which are not visible in a society as much as they should be so you uh, a vision that how we could have them along and unless we don't have that vision as an organization as a country as a policy makers it will uh, it will not have its cascading impact till the bottom down and if you have that vision you need to along with it have a dedicated resources so while the country has uh the all the laws in place the policy in place uh what are the dedicated resources about uh, whether they are there or not we have three percent i'm sure there are other esteemed panel members uh, who are more acquainted and will doing more advocacy work than what we have been doing uh but we have this three percent of uh, you know reservations for um people with disability to be inducted in the jobs and all but are there resources enough uh whereby um people would be having that qualification skills uh, competency to be employed doing that jobs we do not have do we have our reading materials our books literature which are in braille which are uh, friendly for them to get into higher education no we have a long way to go i mean even um, there are there is no one computer in my faculty of course we have been talking about online education which teaches anything 
you know, having an audio way of, of doing it, which could facilitate. So um, very sorry to say, but we have not had though uh, a single student who is who is blind, uh, who has so far, who could be one wonderful resource. So you uh, do we have a dedicated resources to have this inclusion possible? And if we do not have, it's it, it's the, the vision that we see, it's not gonna be possible. With dedicated resources, as you rightly said in your last slide, and that is a sensitization of all the stakeholders, which is um, so very important. And uh, we we are in Vipati Ben, and um, I began with her in my early, uh, 90s or late 80s about sensitizing right from police to judiciary to health professionals and everyone about gender issues. Uh, we have a long way to go about people with disabilities sensitizing them. So if you even if you look at our public infrastructure, our public resources in terms of hospitals, railways, uh, any transportations, banks, post office, there is no sensitivity um, for, uh, to even be a uh, old elderly population, which is increasing in number in India. So forget about them, we are people with disabilities. So how uh, the sensitivity can be built in, uh, that itself is an uh, issue. The fourth is, of course, we need to have a job mapping. Where are those map, uh, jobs available vis-a-vis -vis the supply? We did one small little, uh, uh, you know, Vibhuti uh, you can stop me when I have crossing my time. Um, so, um, uh, in, uh, in nearer to Baroda, we have a, a place called Jambusar Taluka, where uh, I'm associated with one voluntary organizations, and we started mapping uh, the number of people with disability living there, and to our very, very surprise, in that 10 villages around, we found more than 400 people with disability, which we could never imagine, and that's, that itself talks about what you said, that one-fifth of our population, world population, is people with disability, which could be just a tip of the iceberg. Uh, and in a country like India, where, um, you know, a lot is, uh, the data is gets hidden because of a lot of reasons, uh, lack of awareness, uh, reaching out, or accessibility of, you know, data collections and everything. Um, this number is a huge number when you look at that. So how the interventions, um, you know, is possible uh, in right from primary school, uh, Balwadi, Anganwadi, what we say is nursery to higher education, the issue that you touched upon, Dr. Yes, Barnabin, yes you, you brought out a very important point of accessibility, affordability, availability, and quality of services. And along with that, I think the prejudice, which you see among the employers also, because I have sat in so many selection committee, two percent reservation per person with disability. Also, I have seen other panel member trying to subvert they would not. At the most, they would say take person with polio so that our workload doesn't increase. Yeah. But if you say any other type of disability, then there is a tremendous thing. And these are the highly qualified, otherwise they are progressive people. But when it comes to taking them as our colleague in the end, and I think one colleague, very nice, very, very it is heartbreaking that uh, she say she had to say that I am treated as a piece of furniture, not as a human being. So it is really a very, very sad scenario, and we have a long way to go, as you correctly say. And now I would like to come to Dr. Uh, uh, Renu, uh, to our Miss Nidhi Goel. Your organization, Rising Flame, mentors young professionals, conducts research, and proactively conducts public education program. Do you see any change in the uh, actual uh, field and also in the reality. Uh, Dr. Renu Adlakha will not be able to join because her Wi-Fi is not working. So I would request <laughs> Ms. Nidhi Goyal, can you also reflect on the persons with disability uh, equal opportunities protection of rights school participants act 1995 and uh, which was in for, enforced in, uh, in 1996. Now 10 years later India enacted right of Persons with Disabilities Act 2016. What are your critical reflections on the act? Over to yes. Ms. Nidhi Goy. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for putting me on this spot. Um, I've, I've really, it's been so interesting to hear my colleagues and there have been so many points and so many diverse points for all of us to think about um, in terms of disability, in terms of disability inclusion, in terms of the intersection of disability and gender and other access of marginalizations. Let me respond first to whether there has been change, right? One of the milestones where you could say change has happened is just moving from the 
um, previous act to now a more compliant act. But let's let's begin with something basic. And, and my colleagues have addressed on some of these, but let's emphasize some important points. Um, what's the critical issue here? The critical issue in society, in participation of persons with disabilities is that, um, and uh, Vibhuti ji just mentioned it so beautifully um, and heartbreakingly that one of the colleagues said that she's treated as a piece of furniture. Persons with disabilities are demonized. Women with disabilities are not considered as women enough. And therefore, just to establish disability rights as a human rights issue is a struggle, right? We talk about human rights. So a lot of people ask me, what do you do when I say I work for human rights? They say, oh, but you work for rights of people with disabilities, right? Somehow there is this divorce in the understanding of, there's a separation, there's a, um, there's a gap when we try to understand what human rights are and somehow people with disabilities are left out of it. Just that kind of understanding or comprehension or discourse or public imagination also tells you how people with disabilities are doing that. Yes, so let's begin with what's been the change. Are we counted in census? Yes. Um, you know, people will tell you um, roughly over 2%, just over 2% of persons live with a disability in India. Um, within that, again, you have a percentage of women with disabilities. Um, but is this representative of the actual numbers? Maybe not, right? So we are invisible, yes. Um, but are we counted? Yes. There has been some movement, but we're still invisible. And why is that? That is because of the stigma. People rather say they have children with a little difficulty, children who are special, children who are a little different, than say that they have family members, children, and God forbid, daughters with a disability. The reason I say God forbid is because the stigma at the intersection of being a woman and being disabled or being a girl and being disabled is extremely high in a society like ours. Do we have uh, some kind of education for women with disabilities? Yes, we do. But what are the percentages? Where are women with disabilities? When we talk about toilets for girls, um, girls in schools and the dropout rates, are we then dividing or disaggregating that kind of data to see if there are accessible toilets existing and how many girls with disabilities drop out because of this? Um, there was a recent research that Rising Flame conducted called Neglected and Forgotten, um, which evaluated the context, uh, the impact of the COVID crisis on women with disabilities. And we found out that um, if there were devices in virtual education, if there were non-disabled and disabled kids, the non-disabled kids were prioritized. If there were disabled kids and or speaking in binaries, if there was a boy child with disability and a girl child with disability, the girl child with disabilities was definitely prioritized prioritized. Are women with disabilities or people with disabilities having jobs? Yes, we just heard an example of how and which disabilities. The hierarchy within disability stands out very prominently here. Um, the discrimination within workplaces is a conversation that even people with disabilities are many a times uh, hesitant to speak about or even engage in because at least they have got a job. Um, and they are able to earn something. Do we have political participation of people with disabilities, particularly women with disabilities? Yes, we have one or two or three um, Mahila Sarpanches uh, with disabilities or some women in as part of child welfare committees and so on and so forth. We definitely see a change. Change is happening in policy, in law, in society. But the point is that the change is happening at an unacceptable slow pace. Right. Um, many a times, many non-disabled activists and many non-disabled people and the public discourses say that people with disabilities remain discontent um, and are dissatisfied with, you know, they don't want to look at the progress. They're not looking at how many policies have been developed for people with disabilities. They're not looking at the United Nations Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities and subsequent legal changes that have happened in many countries, including India. But the point is that people with disabilities and particularly women are constantly asked to live on this access of at least. Um, the at least phenomena, as we like to call it, is that at least there is a change. At least you are seen. At least you're being heard. At least some of you can participate. For example, if you have polio, if you have mild disabilities, at least you're counted in educational institutes. At least you're given job opportunities and this access of um, you know, the, the conversation around at least marginalizes further people with disabilities. So I'm going to um, 
make some of the second question response. And we do have a much progressive law now called Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act, um, which is in compliance, uh, compliance with at least the language and the clauses of the United Nations Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, a convention which was ratified by India and several other, other countries, which is one of the fastest ratified convention globally. Um, but when we reflect deeper, um, it is a very broad and very aspirational law. And where, how do we see the success of this law? What has been the monitoring and evaluation mechanism? Who has been held accountable? And where is the budgetary allocation for this law? There are still questions that we are grappling with. Um, you know, recommendations around accessibility, compliance around accessibility, which was supposed to be done within a set period of time. We don't see that happening yet. We have uh, progressive female clauses around um, harassment, discrimination, assaults on people with disabilities. We have gender included in the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act. Having said that, we still have clauses where legal capacity is defined, but very vaguely, where, where supported decision-making is defined very vaguely, and where we still have the autonomy of certain women with disabilities protected with a major loophole that practitioners could overtake. And I'll give you this specific example because as an activist working on rights of women with disabilities, as a disabled woman myself, as a disabled feminist, in every avatar and identity, um, I am very, very, uh, you know, it's a very difficult thing to accept that the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act talks about termination of pregnancy of women with disabilities, right? And talks about the autonomy that nobody else can decide on their behalf, except in cases of severe disabilities, where a registered medical practitioner and um, the family members slash guardians can take the decision, where the law... Um, Sorry, I'm I'm back. Can you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead. Man. Yes. Please. Okay. So where we still where we don't have any definition for what severe disability looks like, right? And so when you say that women with disabilities have a right to choose if they want to terminate their pregnancy, except in severe disabilities where you don't define what this means. First of all, such an exception is not acceptable. Secondly, not defining this exception means that you want to put all women with disabilities and take away right from their bodily autonomy to their reproductive right. And this is again where such a progressive law hints back to women with disabilities are not women enough, exhibits how social mindsets, how public perceptions, how um, backward the understanding is on women with disabilities and how it continues to influence laws and policies. We have had recently after the um, Nirbhaya, the horrific Nirbhaya gang rape case that happened in India, we had criminal law amendments and they've been extremely progressive and helpful in cases, um, particularly for women and particularly because they address specific needs of women with disabilities while testifying in courts. And we saw in a research published in 2018 um, that the implementation is very poor. And again, circling back to why are these gaps? What is not changing? What is not changing at the rate it should, what is not changing for these changes to be successful is public behavior, is social mindsets. What happens to access to justice when the justice officers or, or you know, actors within the justice system still hold the prejudices against women with disabilities, where a woman with a disability is either considered asexual or hypersexual, and so hence um, a rape report is not either filed or not taken as seriously, or women with disabilities are not considered women enough, and hence a more quote unquote productive man who has raped her, who contributes, assumes, uh, who's assumed to be contributing more to society, is not penalized or, or prosecuted ahead by the justice actors. It's really important to understand that women with disabilities in all of this, in the change to become real, uh, for people with disabilities and people with disabilities standing in multiple intersections. You know, we're talking about gender, but I've still not even touched upon, and I don't want to say I'm talking about all genders because I am specifically talking about women with disabilities. Those standing in multiple marginalizations. What happens to a Dalit person with a disability, a Dalit woman with a disability when she wants to access these laws and policies? Most often they can't even reach the police stations because they are in upper caste, upper class spaces. Um, 
we are talking about a certain access, which is a broader term, which includes accessibility and not just ramps, right? In this age, digital accessibility, physical accessibility, informational access, infrastructural access, all of this is important. Access to healthcare, access to disaster response. What happened in the times of COVID? When vaccination started, which was life-saving and was a big thing, the COVID app uh, where one had to register was not accessible to people across disabilities. Helplines for COVID were not accessible to deaf folks. We spoke about mental health and mental health response was not inclusive. So thinking about access overall is extremely important um, for people with disabilities, access to spaces and discourses. And here I circle back to what my colleague said, being very mindful of time, that all of this access, the change cannot happen and probably we are lacking in the ch change or lacking in realizing the change or making it real is because we are planning this change probably with, for people with disabilities without them. And so inclusion, meaningful participation and decision-making um, autonomy, choice, and decision-making power of people with disabilities, particularly those standing in intersections, is extremely important for change to happen, for us to move a step forward in making the right real, the access real, and inclusion real. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nidhi Goyal, for bringing out a very, very robust and detailed analysis with meticulous uh, uh, documentation based on your experiences and uh, the work that Rising Flame has been doing. It's a unique uh, contribution that Rising Flame is making, not only for our country, but it's an example for all Asian countries and all the um, developing countries, the kind of under tremendous limitations of the uh, institutions, like the macroeconomic institutions, you are doing a commendable work. And you have brought the very important gap analysis and the question of people's perception, as well as the uh, social mindset, how it's a long way to go. We have to change that. And I think it's very important. Now I come to another practitioner, Dr. Purnima, uh, who is from Apnalaya. And we, uh, Apnalaya is also doing an important community-based intervention uh, for handholding and empowerment of people, uh, women with disability. Over to Ms. Purnima Nair. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rupati, for having me uh, session. Um, a quick introduction about Apnalaya. Apnalaya is an organization working with uh, some of the most marginalized populations in uh, urban uh, slum populations. What is uh, am I audible now? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, and uh, talking about disability, we have uh, an extremely robust and holistic uh, approach when it comes to the intervention itself. And I'll try to briefly talk about it. And of course, trying to bring up some of the points that uh, Professor Linda, you have raised and some of the other panel members have also brought up. Um, of course, through the lens of human rights throughout the intervention. So when we look at uh, disability or development delay, we have uh, some of the core uh, elements that include reducing the risks uh, towards disability and development delays, uh, early identification uh, of um, disability and development delay, and the third part that of being uh, uh, the recovery and the rehabilitation. Uh, so as a community-based organization uh, looking at an integrated approach, we start engaging with um, uh, families uh, and women, particularly right from the beginning. So how, how do we bring in that element of awareness um, and um, uh, support uh, right from the beginning. So working with pregnant women, lactating mothers, uh, uh, adolescent girls and boys um, in linking to various uh, health services, uh, antenatal care services, uh, linking them for um, uh, things that are essential when it comes to uh, postnatal care, uh, screenings, uh, for example, hearing screenings and so on. So working with various stakeholders in the for health services, uh, for um, um, uh, reducing the risk and early identification. Then going to the component of awareness uh, and education. So how do we create that awareness on what are the risks 
towards uh, disability uh, in, in communities, particularly in some of our populations where consanguineous marriage are very high. We see a lot of prevalence uh, of disability there. People involved in high risk uh, jobs, which, includes, which increases their risk towards uh, accidents and then uh, related disabilities. So how do we create that awareness within the population? Uh, talking about nutrition, the milestones, how do we, uh, you know, uh, ed educate them on some of these components, making uh, the action a bit proactive in terms of supporting uh, people with uh, development delay and disability. And of course, building capacities of frontline workers on these issues as well. So uh, the frontline workers, whether they're ICDS uh, department or public health department, sensitizing them on various issues. And this is important because we are still in a, in, we are working in communities in, in one of the largest uh, uh, metropolitan of the city where the, the stigma and discrimination towards a person with disability is extremely high, the negligence is high, there is still a lot of hesitancy to even reveal that they would have a person with disability uh, and sometimes they would even um, uh, you know uh, hold back information if they have more than one person uh, or a child more than one child with disability in the family uh, when it comes to livelihood as an organization, um, um, you know, supporting with uh, linking them to livelihood opportunities, not uh, so how do we help people increase their uh, economic capacities uh, and then giving them opportunities to link them, not just to those high risk, um, uh, you know, uh, livelihood options, but the others with help them in increase their capacities and, um, uh, you know, linking them to the right um, uh, resource uh, for improving their health, nutrition, livelihood opportunities. And then coming to the social part, of course, community awareness when it comes to disability uh, development delay and so on, that becomes critical. Uh, and empowerment as whole, well, you know, through increasing the community's agency, um, we're talking about the various issues that I just uh, shared, um, how to look at it from a perspective of reducing and or re mitigating the risk towards development delay and disability, uh, because these communities that we work with, these families are highly um, uh, at, at, at a high risk to some of these issues. And coming to the uh, specific part of uh, recovery and rehabilitation, it starts with the component of um, uh, enumeration, right? How do we start um, uh, enumerating them at the first place? We did do a research um, uh, some um, uh, a while back which talked about disability certificates. So only 8% of people with disability said that they had disability certificate. And if you look at enumeration, the government is using the data that is saying that these are the individuals with disability. So highly, uh, the high uh, undercounting is, uh, this is one of the causes which is causing the high uh, undercounting. Uh, supporting with their health, uh, whether it is medical support, uh, aids and appliances, uh, medical treatment, medical diagnostics, uh, surgeries, so linking them to all the uh, resources and also providing them a lot of financial assistance when it comes to life-saving you know, life drugs that they have to be uh, for a period of time. Um, and linking them to other agencies who do bring them uh, you know, to I would like to ask this. that even during the two years of pandemic, your disability unit was working, was it? Yes, there was not one day that we could, uh, you know, keep our things shut. Uh, it was ongoing throughout the two years. And this particularly was important during those two years. There was no way that we could stop it because when uh, everybody, uh, various uh, government agencies uh, and um, uh, stakeholders are totally involved in COVID, the, the health uh, um, requirement and uh, the humanitarian crisis, um, the, the, the bringing in the uh, uh, importance of talk, working with persons with disability that became even more critical. Uh, so it would be, um, you know, it, like like uh, uh, the one of the uh, panelists talked about, uh, you know, uh, remote, uh, we have virtual classes. How do these children have access to virtual classes? Do they even have the digital access? Do they have, um, do they, are they linked to education institutes that provide uh, um, 
support uh, for children with special needs and so on. Uh, in education, of course, uh, we have had children when we do the house door to door uh, surveys, we get to know that some of the children, three, four, five, have never been outside of home. You know, they are kept um, within the um, uh, within the you know, uh, four walls and have never been in a group. So uh, talking to them about education, we still have a long way to get them to that phase. So then they become a part of our daycare facility, which uh, provides early education, sensitize, supporting caregivers and um, uh, having them uh, on board it because that becomes very critical in sort of handholding support for the entire journey that we are looking at from childhood to livelihood. Um, and of course, linking them to whether it is a mainstream school or whether it is um, a special school and linking them to entitlements like uh, schools, uh, like uh, educational scholarships and so on. And uh, then in livelihood, again, we have linking with various uh, vocational training, uh, employability op opportunities, um, and uh, supporting them in entrepreneurial projects. So how do we, uh, you know, um, uh, empower them? How do we bring in that spark of having them also think of an entrepreneurial uh, opportunity as, as, a, as even a possibility for them? So it could be, you know, somebody, um, a, a, a small uh, support that goes in is uh, if we had an individual uh, with disability uh, who was supported with a sewing machine and then linked to government agency for uh, uh, procuring loan who is now in the process of uh, procuring the her second uh, sewing machine right so then that that's a journey that we want to support throughout um, and then these initiatives sort of help us also bring the groups together. Uh, so when it comes to the social elements, so how do we give them opportunities for social, uh, so the cultural and uh, art uh, uh, platform? How do we get them to perform there? How do we get them to engage? So every year we have a sports event that we do, not just for children with disability, but where other children, also children without disability participate together to experience how it is, you know, we had this, uh, this, this uh, uh, an example was this, uh, there was a, a track race and where, you know, you would sort of um, uh, put the child without disability in a position where they do experience what it is to run without a limb, right? And then how, how that how that is. So it was more a part of getting all of them together, um, you know, having uh, drawing um, uh, competitions and so on with both children with and without disabilities, performances, a stage uh, performance and as an opportunity within the community and bringing them outside of the slum population. Let others also see the kind of capabilities these kids have, uh, the young uh, groups have. Even you have uh, to organize sports activity also, no? Yes, a sports, cultural, and art is something that we try to bring in also as a part of uh, the social inclusion. And of course, empowerment and uh, like some of the panels have also said a lot training of- training modules for the beginners? Yes. And so the internship we... training program, mentoring of interns. Uh, we do have a, a de uh, in depth the volunteering training that goes in. So these are individuals with disability, without disability, and people who are from the community. Um, uh, you know, uh, who would be a caregiver for a person with disability, somebody who does have some uh, sensitivities but does need some direction of how they can support. So, for example, we have volunteers who are supporting other individuals for procuring disability certificates, free pass, bus pass. Uh, free the railway pass, taking them to vocational training uh, centers and so on. So this becomes very critical when we talk about empowerment. It is not empowerment only uh, looking at individuals with disability. How do we get other stakeholders also involved and supporting to build that ecosystem for uh, persons with disability, particularly for the most vulnerable populations? So are your knowledge people? products in public domain? point of time we are in process in streamlining some of those things and we are hoping to share uh, we do have some uh, research uh, piece that is sort of derived from the kind of work that we do and uh, i'm happy to share this with the group and otherwise it's available on our website yeah. so thank you very much uh, Ms. purnima nair for an extremely inspiring profiling of the multifaceted activities of apnalaya we have really it, it boosted our morale and uh, now I would like to ask uh, 
Dr. Prerna Sharma, for, who has done her PhD in, uh, on right-based approach for persons with disability. So Dr. Prerna, can you share your, the highlights of your uh, dissertation, PhD thesis, and how have you applied your knowledge in your professional work as a social worker? Over to Dr. Prerna Sharma. Please unmute yourself, ma'am. Apologies. Uh, thank you so much for having me on this esteemed panel. It is, I am honored to be here. Uh, Professor Vibhuti Patel, Dr. Arjun, Professor Linda Lane, and all my uh, esteemed colleagues. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, um, my uh, doctoral thesis is on human rights entitlements of children with disabilities with special reference to parents' perceptions. So um, I had... Um, I had conducted this research in Mumbai, and um, basically uh, the the universe that I had selected was uh, children from six to fourteen years of age. I wanted to understand if they are able to access their rights, human rights entitlements, in all areas, and because these are children dependent on parents, so um, my um, uh, concern was whether the parents are able to ensure children's their children with disabilities entitlements are getting fulfilled or not. Um, the and I had also in, uh, interviewed some um, you know occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech therapists from different NGOs and organizations and some heads of institutions. I found out uh, that. Um, the parents of children with disabilities did not really look at rights entitlements as uh, entitlement to education, right to play, right to leisure activities, right to recreational activities, right, right to health, yes, because uh, they looked at disability as a health concern. They didn't look at disability as, as something diverse from the rest of the uh, children and something to be accepted as not um, a punishment or for something that any one of their family members, most of them looked at it as as um, uh, as a result of some some sin or some karma or all that. And they looked at rights as right to property, whether their children with disabilities will get uh, their, uh, will they be able to ensure right to property? So um, majority of the parents were of that belief. It, um, the, I found while I was discussing with parents that they were also learning about the rights that were, um, you know, um, a part of the UNCRC, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, and India is a signatory, then UNCRPD, India is a signatory, that their children had equal access to rights. Uh, this, unfortunately, was my... Um, uh, the main finding and then i did an um they had prepared a, um, an awareness table and there was some tools for that and um then i have been uh, when i while, while i was with sndt women's university i was teaching uh, child rights and social work as a course in the fourth semester the final semester of masters in social work program and um, since uh, it's rights of children, so rights-based approach is what uh, I have been teaching. And also, and that also became, you know, it was a beautiful uh, synchronization of what I was teaching, what I was researching simultaneously. And I realized, uh, although we had this um, beautiful act in place, but the implementation was a serious concern because um, uh, already the Ministry of uh, Social Justice Empowerment had been created and children with disabilities and all people with disabilities were being looked after by the Ministry of Human Justice and Social Empowerment. Whereas when it came to education for children with disabilities, that also was under the uh, Human Justice uh, Ministry of Human Justice and Social Empowerment. But for the rest of the uh, children, the education was under, at that point in time, human resource development. And uh, the children with disabilities somewhere were falling between the cracks, between two ministries, their 
their need for education, their um, um, especially education was, uh, you know, was not being recognized as a rights based um, entitled entitlement of children uh, with disabilities. When it came to, you know, uh, uh, play, leisure, um, they were, they, they, I mean, they, it was assumed that since they are unable to uh, join children because of the limitations that their disabilities have imposed on them, they were to, they could witness, they could, but efforts to include children in activities, whether it was arts, whether it was extracurricular, whether it was co-curricular, whether it was sports, was not being made. I was so very glad uh, just now when Ms. Purnima Nair was sharing about the sports activities of children with and without disabilities. I think it is the most uh, beautiful way of, you know, sensitizing children with disabilities to the needs of children with, with disabilities. Children without disabilities, learning and, uh, you know, even that experience of uh, doing track events or uh, sport, other sports activities along with children with disabilities will make them better accepting adults because of this experience. It was, it was really beautiful. Inclusion uh, was, inclusion still is a very, um, it's a, it, I mean, if we are, we have to give, uh, ensure rights fulfillment of individuals with disability, children, women, then inclusion is critically important. However, inclusion as of now is still being used as a vision, but ensuring that that vision gets translated into practice, we still have a long journey. The, the concept of universal design whether, I mean, I have seen it, I have read it in papers, in policy documents, but where the implementation is still a long way. And when we come to the rights-based approach, uh, like I mentioned, the most important things when you're talking about rights-based approach, there is this uh, concept of PANEL, P-A-N-E-L, which is an acronym for participation, accountability, non-discrimination and equality, empowerment and legality. Uh, whether, I mean, how much, uh, how, how much are the individuals with disability taken into consideration when decisions are being made regarding their lives, regarding their needs. So uh, although we have this uh, adage, nothing about us without us, it's, it's a very powerful statement. How much are we actually being able to include people with disabilities in decisions that are being made about them? Uh, again, like our other panelists have said, we still have a long journey. Um, Non-discrimination, we, I mean, people are still being discriminated. We have the right words. We have a good uh, law, which got, um, which got, um, I mean, revised, reviewed, and we have now better provisions. The provisions being implemented to what extent, how, where are the, when there is a legislation, legislation has to be followed up with a policy document, which has to be followed up with action points. I am, uh, I, those policy documents, I hope are being prepared, although the law came in 2016 again, after revision, uh, the actions that should have been there there are some small steps, but, and, and, and our country is huge with a huge population with diverse needs and complexities of many various kinds and intersectionalities. We like um, Nidhi was mentioning about, you know, a Dalit woman. The Dalit woman, first of all, how many Dalit women are, Dalit disabled women, how many of them are aware of their rights? 
if somebody has if they are aware then like she mentioned the struggle that they have to go through to just even be heard and doing and making an fir and all that is a it's a very 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 uphill task um i have been able to make uh, i have been able to sensitize uh i think eight or nine batches of students at, through my work at sndt women's university on rights of children rights of all marginalized children including children with disabilities how to how to uh, ensure that rights based approach what is the framework how to implement it how to uh, how to uh, measure where rights are being fulfilled to what extent are they being fulfilled and uh, how to bring about um, change through a discourse in the community with the involving the people ensuring that their voices get represented when plans and decisions are being taken this is this in this way i have been able to make a difference and i am very glad sometimes when i meet my students uh, they 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 have been they have come and told me ma'am what we learned in child rights program with you and the rights based approach through that child rights program we we that has equipped us to work with children or people on a rights based approach one last point that i would like to make is when we are talking about rights based approach and we are talking about working with governments we need to be aware that the approach has to be both top down and bottom up bottom up which is uh, empowerment empowering process when we are uh, using the bottom up approach we are uh, including the people in the community and um, taking their voices listening to them their vis vision and view for their future and their inclusion that is the bottom up approach which is very empowering for the community and it does bring up issues which the policy makers and um others may not be able to even think of because they uh, bottom up approach brings up lived ex, um, suggestions on the basis of lived experiences that people have whereas the top down approach is strengthening of institutions approach so the people at the decision making policy making level when they are able to strengthen the institutions which are responsible for implementing the policies and the legislations then a combination of bottom up and top down approach a combination of empowerment and empowerment of the people and the strengthening of uh, institutions frameworks uh, together will be able to make a difference and with this i would like to thank you all for listening to me patiently thank you dr prerna sharma for uh, highlighting the importance of both bottom up approach which uh, is based on lived experiences and it also ensures the agency of the people yes. involved and also the top down approach uh, where strengthening of institution is very important and i think for both like for inclusion it's very important to get out of that rat race of cutthroatism you know that minimality that kind of thing has to go because uh, and the more cooperation and the processes they need to be uh, highlighted because the human essence is more important rather than uh, the human relations are not wars no where you lose or win so that i think that also we as teachers will have to bring to the to our uh, take it to forward to the community and students now i would like to ask dr sandhya lemay uh, your institution is your center is my first of uh, like first of its kind and globally respected for its teaching research documentation extension work and uh, also training of the people that you have been doing uh, can you share the path breaking contribution of your center for disability studies and rights of persons with disability over to dr sandhya lime professor sandhya lime please unmute yourself and join us hello hello it is Yes, yeah. we can hear you, ma'am. Please. Yes, go. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me in that webinar, gender and disability, because this is my area. 
amount especially including education in higher education and therefore uh, that is what i am going to explain you only on related to the higher education now i would like to take a few point before starting this one i joined around 1990 they went i don't remember me <laughs> and then from that onward i am working with the student with disability in the tit but last 15 year it become the more active action oriented this one because of the different policy because of the new law act and because of the university grant commission rule so it become more visible now so at the beginning 35 year that we were trucking how to help student with disability and there was a less number of the student with disability in the higher education especially student with vision impairment and student with locomotor disability now if you look at the trend the student with ear ear impairment student with learning disability student with attention deficit hyperactivity they are joining now and therefore this is a good trend for all of us because we talk about the inclusion but inclusion is only for the particular type of the disability here more and more disabled population are coming in that higher education so before tarti the action uh, it was a two major thing one is teacher and one is uh, the other is student with disability regarding the teacher teacher did not know what is the meaning of the disability what is the implication of the disability how to teach the student with disability about the curriculum pedagogy field work teacher so and they have not they have no knowledge about it they lack training and therefore they get uncomfortable with student with disability but later on because of the continuous program undertaken by the center for disability studies and action and equal opportunity then now the picture is becoming different this one second point it about that student with disability once they join to tit you maybe all of you might be aware about that tit education pedagogy it is not a rote learning it is a learning by doing up there for it become difficult for the student with disability to accept this new approach and they are struggling and how tit the center for disability studies and action and equal opportunity to help the student with disability to answer to the new curriculum and that is the important for all of us this one so these were the two major issue we found it now when you talk them out the path breaking contribution we tried based on the need of the student with disability so we have to remember that all student with disabilities are not equal each one is unique and therefore their need are different and therefore the intervention for one student may not be similar for other student with disability so it becomes more challenging job for all of us so when we talk them out the action the first one action taken by us is that among the admission when tit admission work going on in every march now we are starting from today every year in month of march we have admission process we develop guidelines for the panel who take interview of the candidate with disability panel should know the nature of the disability and how and in what way we can take interview of the candidate so that candidate becomes comfortable and it can be selected for the course that one major so i remember once you had called me and first thing you did was tying my eyes for nearly half an hour and though there was a facilitator and you asked me to walk for uh, i think maybe 100 meters and i think that was a humbling experience for me also correct thank you thank you so that is why very important one after the admission when the student join in tit that we make the list of the student how many student with disability are in tit and what kind of the disability so we make a profile and we meet each student to find out it the major problem is that visible disability can get more attention more sympathy compared to the invisible disability in visible disability means the learning disability is attached deficient disorder or mild cerebral palsy or uh, ear impairment and it become difficult for us to help them this one because they are not willing to accept the aid so continuous 
talking to them, developing dialogue between the teachers and the students, that we try to help the students to accept their own disability. That is the one important thing. We work with the teacher and how to work with the student with disability regarding curriculum, field of teacher, and develop the dialogue between you. However, we cannot blame the teachers alone. Students with disabilities are not comfortable to share, and therefore we have the appetite that students with disability to talk, explain what kind of the disability and what kind of the help you require. That helps a, a lot. That is the one thing. Now regarding the student with disability, is there that uh, we work with the curriculum. Now curriculum that student with which impairment they could not read the BPT. So we send the PPT copy before the class. So that student with which impairment can read the PPT and then can participate in the class, this one. Student with ear impairment, they require the lip reading. We don't have time language interpreter. Only one student who use time language in development study, we provided time language interpreter. But otherwise, they are oral days. And therefore, it takes the time for all of us to explain them. We have to make sure that they can see our lip reading. So sometimes I always tell them that, okay, try to understand what I am saying. Peers will help them. So we encourage the peers to be part of this process, this one. And then we explain again after the class. That was we help the student with ear impairment. We conduct a challenge challenge program once in the year for the TIH community. Academic tap, non-academic tap, student without disability and student with disability. And make them aware about the different type of the disability. We provide the activity to sensitize to understand how they feel to become a particular disability and what strategy they should adopt to help the student with disability. That one part is Second is that related to the field work. Everybody talks about that the field work, field work, field work, but how to help the student with disability in the field work? For example, student in, with ear impairment, they find it difficult to communicate with the people in the club area, in the school. So sometimes we have to go with them, explain. It takes too much time, but we have to support them because they get frustration. They thought about the three time mental health which is affected. So it is not very easy for all of us to work with that. So everybody talks about that. There is a law related to the inclusion, exclusion. Actually, it is very difficult. Inclusion is a continuous protein. And today you got inclusion, tomorrow it is exclusion. So there is no guarantee. So we have to work continuously without tiring. We need a lot of patience to work with that this one. Reacher, how to do reacher? What is the quantitative, qualitative? Student mean ear impairment, find difficult to understand, find difficult to take interview for to collect the data. Regarding the student with visual impairment, they find difficult to use the quantitative because they can't read the table, they can't read this one, and they find difficult to do this. Student with learning disability, they find difficult to understand, crappy, and analyze the situation. So I have a PhD in student with visual impairment, student with learning disability, and student with ear impairment, and I don't know how I am struggling to help them to do this one, because we believe in inclusion empowerment, but it's not very easy job as a faculty, this one. Uh, one is that we have to uh, try to provide the accessibility, not only physical accessibility, but uh, any kind of accessibility related to the wave accessibility, social accessibility. We conduct a MyField program once in the year, so that all students with disability can perform their talent can present their performance and they can get confidence. Yet they can do. That was the important for all of us, this one. And then we have the library facility for the student with a visual impairment. Jaws related is their font. You can make a big font to read this one. So we have a lot of facilities. You have books library. in Braille? Yes. Yes. And that uh, there is also another one is that when we conducted the challenge, challenge program, we always explain all the students to the people first language. Don't call deaf, dumb, blind, or this one. We always use people first language. And that is very important. And we try not to use the word handicap or anything. It is very important for all of us. Because this is the way of the sharpening your skill. 
and change your attitude. And that is third, it, it takes the time to imbibe that attitude. But we have to make an effort to do this thing. We, the counter, are not professional counter, but we know how to do counter because I teach the course at the counter and I'm a counter. But we also refer the student to the counter teacher. The problem of that counter teacher that they don't know how to work with a particular type of the teacher. So we have to help them to do this work. And it was found that they have many problems. Frustration they get. Fear of rejection. Discrimination that they feel. They are, some of them are not able to cope in the curriculum. They have a lack of confidence. So many issues are there, this one. And therefore, how to help them? It's an important term. Very difficult for all of us because you know mental health issues, it's a fluctuating, anything can happen at any time we have to prepare for this one. We cannot guarantee that there is a particular issue you will get. So sometimes we are also getting shocked and we have to learn how to live in general. Okay, the last point is that when you look about that uh, student with disability profile that majority are students with visual impairment followed by locomotor disability and late is that uh, ear impairment, learning disability and other disorders. What is there is that uh, male with disability is more than the female with disability. Majority have a visual impairment, men with visual impairment are more than compared to the other one. If you talk about the gender, this one, it is also noted that men with disability also get a lot of problem, masculinity problem. They are expected to perform at the male, at the masculinity. And when they come to the TI the campus, they get confident, they get uh, low self esteem. Because other male also point out this one that you are male, but you are not able to take it the process. And through socialization process, we develop the negative attitude towards the people with disability. That also reflects in the campus. So we have to do a lot of work with this one. And men with disability often do not share too much. They do not cry because of the socialization process. So our difficult job for all of us to motivate the student, male student with disability, this one. For the female with disability, compared to the male with disability, women with disability get weakly and it's to the environment. Maybe it is because of the through socialization process that you are woman, you are supposed to learn how to live in that environment. And it is really help the girls with disability to initiate the campus weekly this one. However, they are also have an experience of the discrimination, abuse, and they feel that relationship issues also there and they get less sympathy compared to the male with disability. People are ready to have male with disability but not women with disability. Maybe they have fear of the abuse or maybe they don't have any particular reason that they are women, it's okay. What are the issues in there? But they are not open to share why they have this negative attitude of people. Mental health issue is very common among the women with disability because they get a lot of parental issues, a lot of parental opposition. And some of them run away from the home to get better education, hope that they will get this one. So this was the overall my observation of this. The last point is that after a few years, when they passed out and left TIT, after a few years, some of them meet me. They have told me very strongly that, Madam, TIT life was very tough, but we learn how to live in the diversity population, how to deal with the stigma, how to deal with that uh, discrimination detail, and how to become more independent. When we left the IIT, this experience, this exercise really helped us to become more independent outside the IIT world. And thank to all of you, that was what they told me. One is there is that uh, one deaf boy, one deaf blind boy. I'm talking about a deaf blind. Now he becomes the what is the UPSE exam? He got he becomes the officer like a IS officer in Assam. He came to TI and he mentioned my name in that it is because of the professor may I'm here today. So that was the great acknowledgement. It is like a, you know, we got a reward of our hard working. Thank you very much.
excellent professor sandhya limre i any interaction with you even being in your doctoral advisory committee has always been an excellent learning experience extremely inspiring experience i get my tonic for the future work and uh, how to uh, one learns a lot about you and i think here even in the chat box there are comments about uh, with uh, dr derima has written with professor sandhya now the statement nothing about us without us is justified thank you panel and uh, i think that it's very interesting mm -hmm. now the last uh, panelist today is professor sujata ban uh, she they are offering amed and uh, i think and diploma and certificate courses in special education the most important thing is that it is not only classroom teaching but the work which they do in terms of uh, training and extension work and their pro project uh, arushi project that is uh, extremely important and it is sndt women's universities jewel in the crown the department of special education over to head of the department of uh, special education of sndt women's university professor sujata ban thank you so much for your kind words uh, first and foremost thank you to imfree for giving me this opportunity and thank you to professor vibhuti patel for asking me to be a part of this esteemed panel i'm really really honored and thankful uh, i would reiterate a lot what dr uh, limai has just said she coming from the training institute and me also coming from a training institute so there are very uh, you know common points which i uh, agree with her so if time allows and if you give me permission can i share my screen i have a small yeah. presentation yeah, yeah, to talk please. about the work happening at department of special education just let me know if it is visible Madam, it is in working mode. Make it yes. a full screen. I'm doing that. I'm doing Lightro mode. Yes, I'm doing that. Yes. Fine. All right. Excellent. So it's visible. All right. So the topic today is gender and disability shifting discourse to focus social inclusion, and I focus on this picture here, which shows that physical inclusion is there of this girl child in a school. in a rural setting but there is no social inclusion the child is sitting on a periphery some children are having those you know eyeballs on her what is this child going to do in this class will she be engaged in the activities that we are doing will she able to participate so on and so forth uh department of special education was started in 1977 with this aim of nurturing and enabling empowering people with disabilities preparing teachers to teach children with disabilities because we believe that if the teacher teaches the way the child can learn then definitely every child can learn be it with any disability so we offer phd program and uh, programs at post graduate and graduate level be it med and pg diploma as vibhuti ma'am just highlighted now the scope of our curriculum is such that we do emphasize on gender issues because uh, as highlighted earlier also women with disability are a victim of double disadvantage double discrimination so our students have to be uh, aware of that and be the advocates for women with disabilities and not just with uh men with disabilities though we are talking about children with disabilities particularly but we also train them uh, for becoming advocates for adults with disabilities focusing on women particularly because sndt primarily believes in empowerment of women so all women related issues are very close to our heart uh so we do recognize that uh, women with disabilities are often the ones who are you know subjected to abuse both within and outside their homes they are neglected by many families particularly when it comes to their education or exploited in many many different ways so we feel and we make sure that our students understand that this gender perspective has to be an integral part of all the policies all the work that they do all the work that's happening at the national level at local level which promotes full employment and rights and fundamental freedom of women with disabilities in particular now what makes our program special 
We use a very dynamic teaching learning experience. We provide that to our students, where our focus is that we give them exposure to a variety of resource persons coming from different parts of the country and abroad who highlight many issues which are universal in nature. Here, I would like to say, you know what Dr. Uh, uh, Lane uh, began with, all the uh, issues and concerns, they resonate with the issues that we also have in India. So that makes it even more important for us to address those issues because they are universal issues. So when they get exposure from international faculty, they understand that there are many things which are universal in nature and they need their attention. Uh, like you can see in the left corner, we have uh, organized programs on gender and disability, and like that, we keep on doing uh, such awareness programs. We also believe in intervention through alternative methodologies. So here in the left corner below, you will see that they're using drama as a way of intervention for helping children with disabilities. Now here, the girl who's sitting on this chair with a mask on her face, without some paint on her face, she will learn disabled girl. Like uh, Professor Limai mentioned, we also have many students with disabilities doing our uh, programs, our BN and MED programs. So what she shared is absolutely true that it requires a lot of persistence, persistence, perseverance, hard work, dedication on the part of teachers to help these students to come up with, you know, that confidence and feel at par with the rest of uh, their peers. And here, a very important role is played by the peers themselves when we go for you know uh, cooperative learning projects where they are all doing things together that helps uh, them to come out of their closets and come out and accept themselves as they are and feel not less or inferior as compared to others so depending upon what their strengths are they are given opportunities you know to uh, maximize their fullest basically. So we every year we have about four or five students in our BN and MED program who are either learning disabled or they are having attention deficit disorder or they're having some emotional problems, but uh, not so many with ID and uh, autism. We have not uh, received any such uh, student at, you know, at higher education level, students with severe disabilities are finding it more difficult. So we've had students with visual impairment and uh, learning disabilities. Definitely every year we have students like that. So we also give them opportunities to reach out to other uh, students who have disabilities or other parents, like you can see over uh, the right uh, upper corner, the students have organized a webinar where they're teaching parents of children with disabilities how to manage challenging behaviors at home during the COVID in particularly. So a lot of opportunities are given to all the students with disabilities and without disabilities to get that leadership training. We also conduct a lot of community outreach programs. Now on the left corner, you'll see that our students are performing a street play at Carter Road to sensitize people about disabilities, about the implications of those disabilities. Now, any change that we want today, the basic thing that comes in the way of the barrier is the prejudice of the people, the lack of knowledge of the people, and not willing to understand that these diverse people are also part of us only. You know, that human rights model that we talk about, it is just a rhetoric, but not many people actually believe in it. So we conduct a lot of such programs to create that awareness throughout. Now in the le uh, left corner down, you will see we adopt schools where children come from poor socioeconomic background. And there we conduct programs like, you know, confidence building, language uh, skills, communication skills, and whatever the needs of the school are, Based on that, we try to our students, along with the faculty, they do these outreach programs to empower members of society who come from the marginalized section. And here, this example is from low socioeconomic strata. Similarly, on the right corner, you'll see on the top, we organize a lot of awareness programs, particularly when we have International Disability Day. We ask different colleges students to participate in our programs now this is a poster making competition and then they reflect on what is their perception of disability and we choose themes related to inclusion themes related to disability awareness and we conduct these programs and that tells us a lot about what are the barriers what are their perceptions and then we have a discussion uh, after uh, such competitions 
below you can see that again to create awareness in the society you have to choose the places so we have every year at the time of diwali barring these two years of pandemic we have stalls in different malls we have uh, you know uh, talks in different malls different activities are done in different malls again to create awareness about disability so this again kind of forms a basis for social inclusion now arushi is our small experimental center where we have children with disabilities primarily intellectual disability autism cerebral palsy visual impairment and uh, down syndrome and we train our students you know whatever they are learning in their classroom this becomes a hands on experience for them to transfer that learning in the classroom on these children in arushi so it's not a very big center it's a small center of about 20 to 25 students where the parents the teachers of arushi and our students along with the children of arushi it is a wonderful synergy that they create and uh, continuously throughout the year a lot of programs are conducted now here you will see a sports day picture on right top down you will see a parent and a child together you know they are making uh, some uh, snacks here it is a picture of gulab jamun so it was like a combination of different activities you can see our students behind they are the ones who conceptualize and implement such programs which gives an opportunity to the parents to come forward work with their children and you know when you engage them they feel so much more empowered and activities like that also empower our students besides creating an opportunity for the children with disabilities to participate in the same we have recently developed a sensory garden now if you look at this it's a garden which is very unique because it stimulates different senses as you can see in the beginning there is a tactile surface on the side there is something like chimes which is an auditory stimulation on the left you can see some plants these are specially selected plants which uh, again stimulate the olfactory sense then as you look on the right side there are different activities like swing seesaw and these activities that they have to go through these uh, tires so uh, you know again to stimulate their vestibular sense kinesthetic sense so this is a garden basically to stimulate the senses of children when we know that sensory stimulation is not just essential for children with disabilities but it is important for cognitive development of all children so this sensory garden becomes a very good platform for inclusion of children with disabilities and without disabilities so when they come together at a very young age a child without disability is uh, you know exposed to children with diversities so that uh, enables him to grow up without any prejudices so we use this garden as you know that's our primary objective for having this garden and uh, i feel when we want to you know and we are aiming at inclusive society inclusive education is but the first step in that direction so it's very important that we expose children young children to these diversities so in our uh, department whenever there is any festival be it ganpati or diwali or any festival any activity that is happening in arushi is never complete without including children from regular school so all the very prestigious schools like manik j cooper arya vidya mandir those who are from bombay would know that these are very prestigious schools so we have developed a relationship with them they always send some children to arushi and together we organize a lot of activities so that i feel is a very good way of you know create, clearing those prejudices in the mind of young children now during the lockdown it was a big struggle for us because many children you know they their parents lost their jobs they were hit economically so many of them left for native places and we were really worried you know how do we maintain uh, their um, education should not uh, they should not regret because if these children who are so used to some regimented routine and when they are just locked in their homes they may be not having access to internet or whatever and they will miss out a lot but somehow we like uh, one of the panelists mentioned earlier not a single day was lost my teachers were determined you know they picked up the 
technology so quickly and they made sure that our children do not miss out on education even for a single day and they were addressing there so many other issues because these children you know they felt claustrophobic just to be in their four walls so they engage them in variety of activities if you allow me i have a three minute video here and i would like you to have a look at what our arushi children did during this lockdown period do i have time to share that professor vibhuti yeah, yeah please please all right all right then i'll have to just stop sharing because i have not turned the sound on just give me a moment stop sharing i'll share again meanwhile i request all the panelists to write your email ids there is a request in the chat box yes Uh-oh, sir, sir. Now just let me know if you can hear the sound. Thank you. Yeah, in so, fact, this is what inspired me. I read it in the newsletter. This one. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we try our best to engage all our students. That is the trainees in activities which are not just restricted to the curriculum prescribed. You know, so they need to understand the bigger issues, the larger issues. So we are constantly, you know, giving them many such skill enhancement programs, and that is our way of preparing them for inclusive world. you see and um, another thing i wanted to highlight before i end is that uh, our curriculum is focusing on special education 
But now there is a change there as well. Rehabilitation Council of India is our governing body, and now they're re looking at the syllabus with new education policy of 2020 that we have to focus on education of each and every student, you know, not leaving anyone behind. So there is a Earlier, it was a single disability perspective to the curriculum. Now it is multiple, multi-disability perspective to the curriculum where every special teacher is not going to be trained in just one disability, but will be able to address diverse learners in the class. And so is the NCTE also looking at it now differently. So anybody who's going to be trained in general education will also learn so much more about not, not just their subject pedagogy, but also how to address diversity in class. So this, uh, you know, the marriage between NCT and RCI, I'm sure will in future prepare teachers who will be able to uh, look at inclusive education in a more positive manner. A lot needs to be done. It's a long journey, but we all try to make difference in our own little ways. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Sujata Ban, for a mind-blowing work that your team of highly creative and competent, innovative and sensitive uh, volunteers as well as teachers are doing and with commitment uh, and also honesty of purpose. And uh, I think it was a very, very, uh, all, all panelists have really done an excellent job. There is one question which I would like Dr. Linda Lane to respond to. That is, there is a push to move away from the terms such as quote unquote blind spot or quote unquote lame or spineless. Are these ableist? Does such nuance in language hold any significance? Does this push come from relatively privileged section or is it one of the easier ways to contribute to social inclusion? Over to Dr. Linda Lane. Please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you. Um, to be perfectly honest, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I really don't know. Uh, there, there is, as I, as I said in my presentation, there are a lot of this kind of uh, moves towards a more kind of uh, identity-based uh, relations with uh, impairments, where we try to look at our impairment as something that is enhancing our identity. Um, this kind of ableist move. Um, that has not been my 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 area of expertise, and I would you know I think I would whatever I say here would probably be a poor response to a, a very important question. So um, I'm I'm just going to leave it there because I, I I just don't have the knowledge to be able to answer it in a competent way. Would any of the panelists like to respond? Hello. Hello. Um, I have yeah. a question. Can I go ahead? Please go ahead. Yeah. Yes, uh, my name is Saurabhi and I'm a research scholar. Uh, so one of my question is um, like, there has been a lot of undermining of uh, uh, people from a disabled community in India. And uh, uh, if, if there is uh, any arrangements between government to government, uh, contacts through uh, sharing of knowledge and um, know-how, uh, in order to um, include, uh, in order to increase the inclusivity of uh, people with disability and uh, help in improvement of, of their condition. If such arrangement exists between uh, government of India and other governments, or uh, will this be a good option like uh, in the future to come? Thank you. Yeah, I think all three of you can uh, answer. Professor Ban, Professor Mehta and Professor Sharma. Yeah. We have one question from Himani, Himani Zopeji also. She is, okay. yeah. Himani ji, would you like to unmute? And yeah, first, please... okay, then both the questions. Okay. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, I'm audible to you. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so I just want to specially ask to the panelists. Please unmute, uh, please, yeah. Please yeah, please yeah. I'm audible? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I just, yeah. So I just want to ask for the uh, to the panelists, uh, the learning disability child. Uh, I am a MSW student. I am uh, I have done my degree of MSW student, and I am very keen to interest in mental health. So I am building the base of my counseling process, like therapy. I am having like two courses simultaneously in therapy counseling, para counseling. 
so the further actually i am sharing my personal thing uh, i am a learning disabled child and i am struggling for the things like for the job purpose because a uh, lot of organization has the working on special need special disability children but they are not uh and enhancing and uplifting the disabled child to uh, work as a employee because i have applied in pratham lot of a uh, lot of very uh, various of organization but they have denied my uh my uh, application and i reached to the final round but they uh, somehow they declined my uh application i don't know why so yeah. it is very uh, difficult for me to get a job and specifically they are working on a disability i think it for that learning disability there are a lot of things have to come uplift a lot of things into uh, and uh, organization and the companies and the a uh, lot of things have to be uplifted but still it is lack of awareness and the uh, not lack of awareness but they are not willing to give that opportunity to the uh, learning disabled child so can you uh shortly uh, um guide me for how we, i can get in the organization and the companies for the job purpose and how i can apply for it because there is no uh, there is only three disabilities i can see oh hh and ph uh, this criteria i can see but um, this fourth so learning disability is not there so how i can go proceed further or i can ha- how i can apply for the for the organizations or the a uh, companies who is actually uh, in taking uh, in taking the learning disabled child uh, candidate for the employment thank you ma'am can i answer this question can yeah. i ask this question i have a story to share i had one student with me for her research work in her she was doing her masters in uh, special education and while she was writing her research proposal i was really finding it so frustrating because every time i would tell her what to write and she would still continue to make the same mistakes while writing her objectives or hypothesis or whatever so at some point i really lost my head over her and then she told me ma'am please don't shout at me i'm actually having learning disability and i thought she was just making an excuse because she was doing her masters and all this while we didn't know that she had learning disability nothing in her behavior visible or un- invisible showed that so then she told me that i have a certificate but because the prejudice the mindset of people is so that even if i'm doing well they will attribute it to some concessions that i have got in the process so i don't want to talk about my disability but because you are losing your temper or whatever so i'm just sharing with you now that girl is doing her phd right now she has worked in a school she is a practicing psychologist today she is a columnist in a newspaper she is doing extremely well for herself but she doesn't let anybody know that she has a learning disability and so many uh, at so many times we've tried to invite her you know to speak to our students and this is a success story but she tells me no ma'am i don't want to tell anybody that i have a learning disability so this is the prejudice the attitude of the society which is coming in your way of getting a job and that can be solved only when there is more awareness people know about you know the amount of things that people with learning disability can do so i'm not trying to tell you that don't uh, i mean you hide about your learning disability and then look for a job but perhaps perhaps at some time that could work for you you know because we are still not ready to accept people in job who we think are less than the able bodied people yeah that's what i want to share with you mom one more thing to share hello yeah. hello professor yeah, professor we will Doctor Sarvi's question has not been answered, so I think, yeah. Uh, Doctor Vibhuti, I wanted to answer the first question that was about blind spot and uh, that yeah. okay. that that yeah. was in the chat box. Yes, yes, uh, yes please. So that um, the basically uh, the language is very powerful, and language is responsible for creating impressions. Impressions lead to. uh experiences and attitude formation so uh, the move actually it is a very uh, i mean uh, it is extremely important for all of us who are working with individuals with disability or for all not only working with individuals with disability for every member of the society to remember to use language which which is person centric which focuses on the person and not on the attribute 
which could be which could be visual impairment or blindness which could be hearing impairment or deaf deafness whatever we need to that is why everyone here i noticed was using the term individual with disability children with disability so the the first term is individual child person woman girl and uh, the these terms blind lame deaf they are stigmatizing they label people and stigmatization labeling leads to stigmatization and experiences of discrimination marginalization and um, and so on so the push is is a part of uh, the social inclusion of individuals with any kinds of attributes i don't even want to say disabilities because of the moment even now now even the word disability has a negative connotation attached to it so what we need to do what all of us need to remember is like any of us is short tall maybe fat maybe too thin likewise there is this attribute which it which is a normal common attribute anybody could have any attribute and uh, that is what is so important so this is a very relevant question and i'm so thankful to you for asking for bringing it up because language is i'm repeating language is very powerful it leads to attitudes in the society which leads to experiences of which are disabling and discriminating the moment we change language we are the the entire perception around a particular attribute changes i hope i have been able to make yeah. some sense to you yeah i strongly agreed with me prerna also that it i the word people first language exactly yeah. that we blind people deaf people better to use the name with ear impairment somebody with that they blind lamb handicap i heard many of them are youthy so we have to be careful because it reflect our negative attitude that's one when you talk about the blind spot how people label a mouth i don't know i'm not aware of that people but later on when you come to know it become the painful experience for the people with yes, yes so that was the issue we have come a long way calling them a moron to today being called an intellectually disabled person so that also tells us like how language is very very critical very very critical very important vipati ben may i answer yeah. uh, sauravi's yeah. question yes, yes, yes. Uh, um, you know so far as my uh, knowledge information goes uh, there is no g to g as a policy right so uh, uh, the way you have uh, for uh, people in prison or uh, for khadi cottage industries you know g2g it becomes without tendering and without any bidding uh, it can be purchased um, but the organizations working for vo vocational skills or uh, livelihood promotion of people with disability and within that also government organizations like we have here a rehabilitation center uh, in the city of adodra rehabilitation center for women with you know disability vocational training center but there is no g2g that is happening there are many reasons uh, also uh, which in terms of quality in terms of you know quality checks and other things but as a policy it is uh, not there which is there for other things so that i i just wanted to share for my state um yeah. responding to another question very quickly uh, of uh, related to the job of a girl msw doing and learning with her disability she said about the job requirement there are organizations uh, if i may you know, add that which have now made uh, diversity and inclusion as their policy and they are really going a big way recruiting people and these are the corporates um, you know which is going a big way uh, recruiting people lemontry is one of such organization which has made that by 2030 uh, they will have almost their 30% of uh, you know employees 30 to 40% of the employees who will be people with disability and uh, they are taking people from across spectrum so it is not just you know um, one particular type type but they have on their board and i'm witness to that uh, you know kind of uh, initiatives that i have and similarly there are, are many corporates who have done it so if you're looking at for a job in corporate i think you should pick up the organizations which are having this kind of policy and are doing a big way um you know and there is a vindya 
a BPO in Bangalore, uh, which is uh, of, you know, which is not only for women, but with people with disability, the entire BPO is managed by uh, people with disability of different types again. And I'm sure with your MSW background, um, it would be a good inclusion even for the, you know, to you to try their, your hands on there and check it out. It's just yeah, yeah. personal. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pamela The last word, Dr. Linda Lane. Yeah, you have to, I know you have to, you have another engagement. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you all very much. I, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm, I'm especially in some, uh, happy for the, the discussion about language because uh, as we see how we talk about what we are and how we name things is important. But I would also like to say that there are people, especially in, in, you know, in my part of the world who are embracing their disability or their impairment. And for them to call themselves uh, lame or a blind spot, it's not at all experienced by them as being something discriminatory. It's, it's them saying, I own who I am in the situation. Uh, and of course, that has taken a long time to get to that stage, you know, so I, I completely understand the, the, the conversation. And I think that was if, if I'm going to have a takeaway from our discussion here today, that has been one of them. So I really appreciate the opportunity to have been able to participate in this uh, really interesting seminar with you. And maybe in the future, we can we can do it again uh, if you want to. And there is an opportunity. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Linda Lane, for such a lively discussion that we had. There are not one, but there are several takeaways of this uh, panel discussion. Uh, and I would like to conclude that disability awareness training is extremely important to shape baggage of biases, unintentional attitudes, beliefs, and stereotypes. We also need data-driven and evidence-based policy intervention, which is need of an hour. We also need gender desegregated data. There is a tremendous undercounting. I think many panelists, they highlighted this. Advocacy at the policy level alone is not enough. It must be accompanied by efforts to proactively empower, support, and strengthen capacity of women and persons with disabilities and marginalized group to ensure their agency who decide what messages to go in public domain and they provide inputs on policies. Being an effective self uh, 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 advocate uh, for disability rights, I think it's very important that all types of uh, injustices which befell on them uh, should be countered with by greater dignity, choice, and independence. And I think the question of autonomy, bodily integrity, they came, uh, the examples of forced, forced abortion, forced hysterectomy, which have seen even the institutions following, government uh, recognized institutions following, I think they, they need to be abhorred. And along with gender issues, we need to take into consideration other dimensions such as economic class, caste, ethnicity, race, sociocultural factors, religious and ethnic minority majority construct, health conditions, public participation, and uh, the whole environmental issue, uh, the issues of the ecosystem, whether it is a corporate or community. Uh, it is also necessary that how the state intervenes in people's lives, especially in their private sphere, uh, so uh, the hysterectomy of so-called quote-unquote mentally challenged girls and women debate, which uh, which took place in India, uh, had a lot of learnings. Media, uh, it also had a major media coverage on the issue. Medical fraternity, social workers, uh, government officers, they all took part in the debate. And I think such debates are extremely important. They need to be sent to stage and interventions need to be analyzed, especially in the context of how state intervention generally can change social values that are detrimental to vulnerable groups. So families, communities, researchers, public intellectuals, and the state will have to work together to guarantee gender sensitive and socially inclusive policies and practices with regard to persons with, with special needs. Uh, now, I would like to thank IMPRI team and panelists and Dr. Linda Lane for such an uh, educative and extremely rich discussion that we had. I uh, now request Impri team to take over. So we are over to you for a vote of thanks. Yes. Thank you, everyone. As we come to the end of this extremely enlightening discussion, I, Zubia, researcher at Impri, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, 
would like to formally propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the IMPRI Gender Impact Study Center. We are grateful to Professor Vibhuti Patel for chairing and leading the special talk on gender and disability, shifting the discourse to focus on social inclusion. We'd also like to express our gratitude to the speaker for today's session, Professor Linda Lane, for taking out her precious time to share her views on the crucial topic. Also, we'd like to thank our esteemed panelists, Professor Bhavna Mehta, Purnima Nayar, Nidhi Goyal, Dr. Prerna Sharma, Professor Sandhya Lemai, Professor Sujata Bhan. Uh, we'd like to thank all of you for adding your diverse perspectives and valuable insights to the deliberation. And of course, we thank all our participants here on Zoom or on Facebook Live for participating and raising pertinent questions. We are grateful if you are watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on our various podcasts. I hope that you continue to tune in future to our gender gap series and improve hashtag web policy talks. Thank you once again, and I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.